What's good, everybody? Hey. How's your fun today? <laughs> How's everybody doing? What did you think of that phenomenon on the screen this evening? Yeah, I thought it was a a, 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 a craft. It was it was it was filmmaking craft, and then the story was just on a whole other level. And it combined them both. Uh, but I'm not going to say too much. I got a lot to say. I, three-hour lectures, I could be here all night. <laughs> but I want to give it up to these people I'm very honored to be with here. This is one of my longtime heroes right here, Ray Rico. And if anybody studies hip-hop, he's one of the most sampled drummers in the funk history and the future of the funk. Yeah. Right here, Ray Rico. And then, Femi's been blowing my mind ever since the punk punk mob opened because I had her sweet water soul and she has that same kind of Betty-ish range that goes from very sweet to very rough. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and it, it started out. <laughs> <laughs> and she did. That, uh, maybe everybody's like, oh, maybe not. Um, but let me get folks' uh, impressions of the film. And then we'll open it up to you guys. Well, Greg, what do you think? Uh, I think the film is, represents the uniqueness and the mystique that exists with Betty and the music and uh, her existence. You know, it's, 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 and like I said earlier, it's just really amazing that all the years, all over the world, I get contacted by people. Filmmakers, writers, that want that are just interested in one of the stories, and the fan base that exists, obviously, in different countries around the world, that are interested and in, in inspired and moved in one way or another by the music. And what she she left behind, you know. Why well, I, I don't I don't mean that boy. She's still here, you know. And as a matter of fact, she's, she's, back, she's back in a, in, a, in a good way. Like I said, she, I got a call from her after this last few years. Just a hello, happy New Year's. And uh, to hear that uh, after the absence of her being. And when I did get a hold of her decades later, when I first got a hold of her in the early, I guess it was the early 2000s, um, time goes by so fast, geez. Uh, you know, you couldn't get a word out of her. And uh, so like that little clip in the film where she was talking to the guys in one of the bands that she was on the road with, that was after the film was being made and, you know, and she was getting recognition and she, she was coming back to herself and she felt relevant again, and I guess. You know, but she, she, went, she went away deep. So it was. It's good to see that, and uh, that happened, and it's. Yeah. And, and here we are now. Yeah. I mean, what what, what, what are your impressions? Um, wow. Well, first of all, it's like um, seeing your reflection in the mirror. Um, I understand about the uh, going away at times, being a black woman artist, rocking, doing everything at times. Um, yeah, that part, and also uh, this this opportunity of black women resting. Yeah, what's yeah. wrong with that? We can do that. So her art sustained itself long enough for her to rest and come back, and that's what's up. Yeah. Really, true. Yeah. So the film itself just made me realize that she's still here. <laughs> Her energy is still here. Her art is still here. There's probably more than we'll ever know until she's ready to share. And so we get to be patient enough for that. So I'm, I'm just like, yeah, black girls to go <laughs> All day. But, yeah. I started to look long term at this, and I realized it took generations for Josephine Baker to be recognized for her career. And 
that he's the Josephine Baker of our generation because she's way ahead of her time and people are now just starting to figure that out. And I had, I remember coming into knowing about Betty and it was always based on her Miles Davis connection, which is very important. And I think music history wise, Betty's gonna have a line and a paragraph and a chapter in the narrative of our music history because she's responsible for the entire change of what jazz became because of what Miles did. And everybody said, well, Miles did this. Well, yeah, he did, but that was because of Betty. That was because of uh, the influence that she had. Um, and so it, it's sweet and sour when I hear that definition. And then I think Betty's the Frida Kahlo of the funk because she's defined by somebody else and she's got her own vision and it takes a while for the rest of us to recognize. Um, so finally, it's on time, we're all here and you guys are all here. So what do you think? What are your impressions? You can have a question or a statement. Um, I was just reacting to your statement about the connection with Miles Davis. I didn't know about her connection with Miles Davis. I was listening to the radio in the 1970s with when Betty Davis had her music. So that was my connection with, with it. A um, question I have about the text of whoever was reading, I'm assuming her words, are they, does anybody know if that's printed somewhere or is she have a memoir? Because, I mean, that was very powerful. Yeah. That was really a key moment, you know, moments in the film. I was like this, wait, waiting for the next time that she would speak. Mm -hmm. Just give us a transcription of that film. That would be great. I'm not sure if we'd have to ask about it. There's another story about Betty said there's, there'll be no book. Okay. She's, not, she's not doing a memoir thing like that. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, I think we can appreciate what we what we get and what we got from here. Anybody else? Now, is it true that Sylvester and the Pointer Sisters sang backups on the first album? And, yeah. And was that recorded in the Bay Area? Yeah, it was, it, we did that in 74, uh, Wally Hiders in San Francisco, yeah. which is no longer there, but it was a great studio, a lot of history, a lot of stuff recorded there. And um, the Pointer mm -hmm. Sisters hadn't had their hit yet, If You Can't Can. Mm -hmm. um, it was their first, their first solo record. Um, they were working with a fellow named Sylvester, who was uh, kind of like a set, uh, 70s disco mm -hmm. star. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Not, not Sylvester Stewart, it's a, it's a, Sylvester. Sylvester, yeah. And, uh, I'm real. I'm real. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so the Pointer Sisters were, I seen them once live, and they were singing background with him, you know, and it was, wow, it was hard edge, dance music, rock, really upbeat, and they were just off the chain. I mean, they just blended like birds, you know, it was incredible. So um, I knew, and I knew David Rubinson, producer, who owned a place called the Automat Record Studio at San Francisco, a very famous place back during that time period. And uh, he was doing demos with them and so on and so forth. So, you know, I hired him to do the background along with Kathy McDonald, who sang with the Stones and Talk had her own solo career. Um, Patrice and, Banks. Sorry? Patrice Banks, Chocolate, wasn't she? Yeah, uh, from, from Larry Grant's group, Grand Central Station, Patrice Banks, and Andy Sampson. Uh, who was a local? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were all in the first album. Yeah, this. I mean, the, 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 what was going on in the mid early seventies in San Francisco was. I mean, San Francisco was the the fishbowl. You know, this was the place. All the music was coming out of here during yeah. that period, and there was moving the world. Yeah, okay, so yeah. it was like it was just like taking a deep breath. You know, it was easy. <laughs> I just came home, got all these people. Larry Graham. Neil Sean playing guitar with Journey, with Santana before that, Ed Merle Saunders, Pete Sears, it was you, just you, uh, myself. You, and, you. Yeah, so I produced and played drums on the record, on the first record. You did? Yeah. 
that so that was the long answer for your short question. <laughs> was it her first record, 1974? 74, yeah. That was her first recording? That's the first record. That was Betty Davis, first Betty Davis. album. Yeah. And there was those recordings that they just recently released her and some of Miles Davis's people. It was still more of an R&B feel. Um, she actually recorded a single called Are You Ready for Betty? Uh, in 1970, uh, 64, I think. Mm. So 45, you can buy, yeah. I got one for $70 and I'm happy I got it. Is that on the, is that on the uh, CBS release with the mom? Yeah, so actually it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't her first recording. She had, when she came to me, she said, you know, she did, uh, you know, I did some recordings with Miles and, and um, his producer, um, um, Miles, Ted. Yeah. Ted. yeah. And uh, she goes, but it's not what I wanted to do. And she had all these, <laughs> a lot of the heavyweights playing on it. But it wasn't the style, it wasn't what she was looking for. <clears throat> and she was very clear on, in her mind, what she wanted. Uh, so, but this, but like when we start, when we got into it, what, how would she, she would describe and introduce a song? She would just hum a line, like a guitar lick or something like that. And that's literally all she started with. And so, but the cast of players that I got together, uh, I felt was would fit. And it was really pretty easy getting to the end results, you know, putting the songs together. Uh, she would, uh, you know, she would, I, I can't explain how she would emulate, emulate how, what she was looking for, but she did. And it was effortless, and um, uh, so you know that's how it came about. It was, and, and, and it, everybody fit and, and played their, you know, fit into the picture and added to it. it was it was it was good chemistry. Yeah. Yeah, I had a question for you. Yeah. Um, the energy that you guys put into. Was it because of just the infectiousness of the times, or was it because the, the person? Uh, well, you know, that's just where I came from. Okay, so, uh, but, you know, she came to me through uh, a fellow by the name of Michael Carabello, who was the original uh, percussionist in Santana, the original Santana group. Um, <coughs> and they were going out at the time. She was living in New York. She came to San Francisco to visit. We were working on a recording project. So, um, I lost my thought. The energy. Well, it was it's, 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 so I had. Weed. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So she came to me. She came to me. I had, so I was from, you know, Slide Family Stone. It was five years. We started the band in December of 1966. I left, it was 71. We recorded that song book during that period. So she knew what she was looking for, and that's what that's the kind of that's the energy and the sound and the spirit that she was looking for. And so, you know, I, when he brought her down to the studio, it was at Wally Hyder's, by the way. Uh, we were doing a project there. And um, I met her that, that day, and by the end of the day, she had asked me to produce the record, and, you know, I didn't know what we were going to get, we get into, and, but she was, uh, she, you know, there was just the way she pre held herself or presented herself, I felt confident that we would create something, you know, and, did. and she felt good about it, I felt good about it, we moved forward, it was pretty, it was, it was easy, it wasn't a rough road. And we're celebrating it 45 years later. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. And by the way, um, so this is, you'll get it by the end of the sentence, uh, this is the 50 year anniversary of Woodstock. Michael Lang is the fellow that put Woodstock on. He was the promoter. He's the one that owned Just Sunshine Records and signed her. So there's this, you know, circle connection. It is. Other comments? In things folks. over time. Yeah. Go ahead. So, you know, back in the 60s, early 70s, FM music was just getting started in the Bay Area. Right. Tom Donahue, you had Thank KMPX. Thank you, Tom Donahue. Right. KMPX, Tom Donahue was Stone, Stone right. Ground, right? Yeah. You had uh, Tom Donahue, you had Case Daniel and KMPX. 
and at that point, funk was also starting to become more accepted. We had Tower of Power, mm -hmm. we had Cold Blood here in the Bay Area. Absolutely. Did her music ever get any playtime? Well, you know, it was just, it was, she was, I, I always did, they go, how would you describe Betty Davis? I said, well, she's, was a female version of George Clinton about 10 years earlier. Okay. And that's really, and she was out there on her own. She, unfortunately, she didn't have anybody handling her management. And uh, she was, could handle her. Yeah. And, and it was like, no one understood. So she was really on her own. His statement was that her music was banned by the NAACP. For what? Yeah. yeah. The NAACP can't ban it. Well, you know. Yeah. She was both. I mean, in, in, in reality, uh, the, the, you know, I mean, just it, you get that feeling from seeing the movie. Actually, I never realized. I mean, to me, when I met her, she was she was like, you know, kind of laid back and really calm and really easy going. And then, yeah, the stage persona was, you know, when this when this came out, when this started and developed, it was like. <laughs> this whole other, this whole other thing, and and so, uh, I guess you know, especially with no one handling it, you know, whenever you you develop an artist, a group, there's a lot of people in back of that. It's not just you know, you could do the music and you you know, but the whole uh, moving forward and developing it and performing and all that is takes a lot of there's a lot of components to that, and to deal with it yourself, especially. You, if you're uh, in a sense, you know, she was radical as far as what was the norm then. So that's a lot to handle. And she would have needed a lot of help to really carry that forward. And, uh, and it would have worked. It, 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 it has on its own. Uh, here we are decades later and it's still alive. You can't say that for a lot of different of music and artists. You know. but, I mean, how do you feel about that sweet and sour? The soft and then the extra hard creation. Well, it's divine feminine. That's yeah, right on. That's, that's pretty much yeah, what it is. Exactly. Um, the light and the dark are in all of us. Um, but with women, we get to do a lot more work. And at times, we still have to continue working when everyone else has had their rest. Um, but to speak on the um, artist part, um, I've never had a manager, and I've always found success through not compromising much of anything, having to uh, strap in, pull my boots and my bra strapped together, tighten up, um, speak louder unnecessarily so, you know, when the soft voice is not working, to be like, where's my money? <laughs> And then it gets, where's my money? But there was a quote that she said in the movie that said, artists starve, like the starving part. Artists starve in silence? That part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Not all, most men artists don't starve in silence. They can, but why are women, us women, we have to do that. Oh, because we're feeding nations, the world, with our energy, our our love, um, compassion, our hardness, you know, and, and then you're black too, add that, and you're funky and you're raw and it's hard, you know? And then to go to the table and have a seat at the table and someone says, reel that back in, we like it, but, 
it's too much. Well, if it's not enough, then it's not enough. And it's never going to be enough, and you can never satiate anyone's desires. So then you just do you as an artist, as a black female artist, ahead of your time. That's a lot of work. And then she was married to Miles Davis. <laughs> she earned it. She said she <laughs> earned her rights at Kikana. I mean, like that right there was just like, mm, girl. And you only get a paragraph, chapter in the book. Exactly. But, mm, speaking to the strength of divine women. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, it's you. Okay. <laughs> All right. So for Ricky and for you, um, did you ever felt like you met or encountered problems? Ooh. And as a musician, as a musical artist, do you could you really identify what she was saying as she's speaking of pro? Do you feel like you can have or there or? Something of another name or, or spirit. spirit animal. Mm -hmm. My spirit animal, I have chosen the hummingbird. Because it, it, a lot of people don't see it when it stops. But if you sit and watch, it will stop and it doesn't die. It keeps going. It's just breathing, you know, and then it goes on and does its thing. Um, I had a moment before I even came here because I couldn't find parking in San Francisco. I'm from Oakland. I'm like, this is just ridiculous. <laughs> you know, and I almost felt like giving up just on that. <laughs> but I'm working on albums and I'm writing and creating and collabing. You know, it's just a moment and you just keep going. Yeah. Sometimes you can't. Yeah. You know, that doesn't define you. I'm still here. We are still here. Our art doesn't necessarily have a timeline. It's divine. When when you're uh, when you're having time with the muse, yeah. you gotta talk to it, her, it, yeah, and yeah. it, yeah. that. Um, so. Okay. Can I say something? I don't need to talk. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that I think the most profound part of the movie for me. I'm from that era. I was a funster. I danced that. And this thing. That's my era. That's my age. And that and I also was very much in the music scene. And when I when I you know, she was married to Miles Davis, and I had a partner that knew Miles Davis, and I knew the whole insides of that. And everything, you know, the whole movie to me really kept going back to that part of how oppressed we were as women. Um, and as a black woman in particular, but as a, it just, if you had a creative idea, there was 10 men there to tell you how not, how messed up it was and how, how you had no value and who did you think you were? And I think from her being with Miles Davis, I think that's part of her going in that hole that she went in because of the extreme I wasn't there, but I was there. And so the abuse, um, and we, we've all been going through for all this time. And so I'm hoping that the sisters now that we can rise up and that we have male men to support us. And if we're way out there, so be it. Yeah. Praise it. Forget the shaming. No more shaming. Because that's what I felt like happened, part of what happened with her. And no wonder she just had to go there. And I hope she may rise again and come back and give us a prayer or something. I would like to speak on that. Her, she had a father. Yes. She, she adored. Did. Yes. So yeah, she true. wasn't like men. Uh, no, you know. that's true. That's and true. that, I that saw in the, the film, there was like a, a break yeah. when the strong, Man, now if her father knew what Moss was doing to her, he would have told a girl, yeah. "You tripping." That's right. So she had a strength in that, in in in, in, in loving her father. Yeah. And when that wind went away, yeah. that part, you know, yeah. uh, I was raised by my father, 
And I know time is time, you know. So to see that, to see the wind and the crow and nothing, and, and then having to still fight and do all this, man, black woman resting. She's still here. Yeah, I, I like to say that I was blessed. I grew up in San Francisco, and I came from that career that this man was talking about, the Tower of Power, Santana, all these Sly, and I was I was 16 years old when I bought her album. Yeah. <laughs> There's, uh, you know, she did. There's three albums. Oh, okay. I did the first one, and then she produced two more after that, and I, then she I've disappeared. Got, I've got everything that she recorded or that I've been able to find, but with the Columbia, which was a surprise that it was actually there. What I really like to be able to hear is the process that she did in the recording studio as she spoke to the musicians and. You know, elicited from them what she wanted and built that music. That would fascinate the living hell out of me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there wasn't much documentation yeah. of that process. You know, I mean, I had a few tapes which they showed that I was looking for tapes from the rehearsals and I didn't want to set, you know, and was, that was in real time, by the way. You know. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it wasn't, there's not that footage that we see yeah. live there. I had never seen it. Matter of fact, I don't know how they finally found mm -hmm. If they put the word out, someone had something somewhere in some country. I think it was from Europe, Germany, or some club. Yeah. And I mean, there wasn't much documented back then, unfortunately. You know, this is looking a lot. You're probably familiar with this because I've done these events. Where people are asking about what happened to Sly Stone? Yeah. Tell us more about Sly. Where did he go? I want to see more of this. And he, he has to put up with this now because he's part of all these heroes. Well, go ahead. And Sly is still with us too. Right. So. I have a question. Um, it was pretty evident that she adored her father. What about her relationship with her mother? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I never heard any. I never heard her talk about it. You know, she talked about her father, so I don't know about her mother. And uh, in, in the film, uh, that subject wasn't touched upon either. No, not really. Good she picked her up and took her home, and that was the last we heard. Yeah. 
Anybody else? Um, okay. Oh, please go ahead. Uh, couple things. Um, there's a reference about her relationship with her mother on tape. Nasty Gal Movie. Yeah. Nasty Gal Movie. Nasty Gal Movie. They are selling the disc. Now, some of you may have to wait for after you saw it for him to say that. <laughs> I actually had a conversation with Betty Davis on February 5th, which was the basis of the article from the Chronicle a couple of days ago. So there's a lot of misconceptions. Uh, for example, uh, that, uh, that first record, Getting Ready for Betty, was produced by a guy named uh, Don Costa, who actually used to arrange for Frank Sinatra. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go to Wikipedia, it says, it says the first record she made was produced by Lou Courtney. But that's not correct. She said, no, it was Don Costa. And also, another misconception, Greg, you can probably confirm this, a lot of journalists have said that she introduced Miles to Jimmy, which she did, yeah. and Sly, which she didn't. She just introduced Miles to the music yeah. of Sly's yeah. I was the connection to Sly's, and so that was misinterpreted, yeah, yeah. As, as you see, but no. That's a T-watch, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so actually, for anybody who came in after my original introduction, this evening is thanks to T-watch. We're having it tonight because of him. And he's the author of the Chronicle article that was in the paper yesterday. Um, Much of which, yes. <laughs> Stuff we're talking about, the Chronicle didn't want, so I still got a not relevant information. She doesn't talk volumes, but she says what she needs to say. So I'm looking forward to releasing the rest of that. Yeah, we're going to see it. Yes, please. Yes, please. Or like a funny show or like a fan club that we can write to her. Um, it would be great to send her a note and let her know how many people were here tonight. Uh, I'd love to know that. That's a very good question. You can write to Danielle Mag Maggio. I don't think yet, but she has a, an advocate in Pittsburgh. Her name is Danielle Maggio. She's a, um, an academic and a supporter of, of Betty, and, and that's kind of the conduit if, if you want to uh, go through Danielle Mag Maggio, M A G G I O. And I'll ask her if, if there is some sort of official Betty page that uh, people can be going to, and and at least Danielle can let Betty know about this. So maybe a lot of us know how it is. We think we're up to date, and six months later we're behind the tech, and we don't know. We don't want to go through all that frustration, and so you know somebody might have to uh, you know get Betty up to speed with that once she's interested, and hopefully she will. Be. Somebody over here had a hand up. I was just going to ask if you um, could talk a little bit, or if you know a little bit about the connection between Betty and um, Yoko Ono Jobber. I didn't see in my research, as I was naming the space, and for these same reasons, uh, women in the arts, women, cultural leaders, icons, don't get the credit they deserve for their contributions exactly. to moving culture forward. That's why I named the space Betty. Oh no, for those two. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Because they were often only discussed as the muses of the white exactly. and not recognized for what they actually started. Yoko politicized John. Yoko was a performance artist. His whole thing with Jay Z and Woo Woo, all of the performance. That was Yoko Ono's work in London, and that's how she met John. And Betty, of course, being who she was. But I saw a photo of them. Hmm. In maybe in Berkeley or San Francisco, Betty and Miles and John and Yoko. Whoa. And that blew my mind because when I put the, 
the space came together, I had no idea that they even hung out or had those relationships. So I'm wondering, since you were there and you know there's more information about that history, is there speak on moments that I was present, like for the group, for Sly and Family Stone. When we were in New York, we were hanging out in the village, and we'd run into Jimmy, literally, just, you know, going down 8th Street. And in the evening, people are going to check out music, going to have a drink, whatever, going to eat. And this would be significant to talk about. So Sly would... This is when he got into his writing, became, I could use the word, more pro prolific from where it started out. I don't know if you heard any like early recordings that, and creations that he was doing. You know, it, it's very basic and simplistic to compare it to where it went to on records like Stand and what have you. The process to get there he would go up to Jimmy and go, how did you, what were you thinking when you, when you did, when you, you know, would refer to a song? Wonderful. And just literally on the street like that and get a response. And the response was valuable in the way that it influenced him in, to think, to go, to dig deeper and making statements of what he was talking about, politically, social, things that were happening. It, and as simple as let's let's get together and ask the music. So those were this is the kind of stuff that was going on then. You know, of course I was in the middle of a uh, how would you say a bright light that shined during that time. So I was privy to these moments, and uh, so that would happen with people like that. People like uh, we were in a, there was a place called Steve Paul Scene in New York City. This little underground music place where everybody, no one knew about some musicians, but the Beatles would be there. Uh, you know, Hendrix would go hang out there and we jam. So he would go up to Paul, and that's the same thing, you know. Not just, what were you thinking about when you did this particular song, whatever? And it wasn't necessarily the direct answer, it was like, you know, the vibe or the way he's expressing yeah, the, the, the spirit that came out and, and what he was thinking and, and whatever the answer was. So it was, it was a significant time and all the music that was written during that period, late 60s, early 70s, we're going to hear it for the rest of our lives and generations to come. That's right. That's right. You can't say that yeah. about music that was created during every de decade. You know, yeah, we'll leave that alone. Just, um, <laughs> if, if you want to sort of look into that moment, uh, there's a film called The U.S. versus John Lennon, and the Nixon administration was trying to deport John Lennon. And uh, he was, he had become an activist, basically. 
And it was cute when the Beatles sang a song about revolution, but when he would get up at an anti-Vietnam War rally and say, we need a revolution in this country, boom, 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 he became an enemy of the state. And so that film talks about it. It's called The U.S. versus John Lennon. And it kind of brings you into that moment. And I don't remember all the rest of the details of it, but that, that's a way for you to uh, kind of start digging and see what connections are there. Somebody have a hand up here? Go ahead. Um, this question is for Fanny, and it's in the same vein as what you just said about women who are married to famous men and their work being minimized over the work of their husbands. Because for me, uh, Betty Davis's work is far more interesting than Miles Davis's music. Um, just lyrically, it's different. It's, it's just different. 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 Um, and just seems way more interesting than her husband's work. And so my question is, what will it take for Betty Davis to be more than a footnote or to have more than a paragraph or a chapter and for her to be seen in her power outside of her connection with being an in the influencer of Miles? I believe at this moment right now that we're in, um, being able to see her hands writing on the on the notepad, um, the one just the one eye, and I'm sure she was like, "I'm an old lady now," yeah, yeah. you know, but she's still here, and for her to be open to say, "I'm ready," to to that you can hear her voice in her own words. Um, you can see her handwriting on a piece of paper, and I, I was trying so hard to like, I will hold it, like read it. And it was hard, and I was like, oh, you know, um, that to me is everything. So this moment, this the space that we have, this time, and the film being able to be out after a long time. She liked them checks her miles. She only liked his shoes. <laughs> and I don't know if many people know, but you always look at man's shoes, right? That's my girl that was up with man's shoes. You can tell a lot about his shoes. But he was he was under her magic. She was younger than he was. He was trying not to be irrelevant. You know, Mike Miles' music was instrumental. There was, there was no lyrics. There was no stories. Okay, it's all about attitude. And that attitude definitely Betty picked up. And so she had stories to tell, lyrically. You know, the music is one component, and uh, and the, the lyrics and the stories were another. So that's probably why you, you would relate to it, especially in the subject matter that she's talking about. Yeah. Um, we're going to have to uh, wrap this up. It's, it's interesting that um, Ray Kate said jazz was behind the music at the time because it was moving towards the funk. And in my classes, I use the line funk is rhythm, rhythm and attitude. Okay? And pile that together, you've got funk, and that becomes hip hop. Uh, so, Kevin, you going to say something? Yeah, there's a gentleman in the back. The sister right here. Here's your question. as if the same thing we were talking about with women being shadowed or in the shadow of the men with whom they were associated, I really want to reiterate that the question was about Betty and Yoko Ono's relationship, and I'm wondering, with all due respect, if you have any memories of that. If you don't, that's fine, but I wanted to actually hear the answer to that while we're here in this space, because that's crazy that you named it without knowing that. And I'm, I'm just too attached to hearing about that if we can while we're in this room tonight. Anything? I, I don't know. Oh, okay. I wasn't there. That's what oh, I'm okay. saying. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you were you're absolutely correct right because it, 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 it does go back to the, 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 a lot of male dominance. Yes, and it was like, we didn't hear about any women that were there at all. 
at all, whether it was them or anybody else that it was that part. Like women that at the time when you guys were in New York, there were any. He ain't telling. You know, I mean, women had women were present then, but probably not as much uh, as far as in the music business and you know, like you know, uh, being in the forefront of saying things through songs socially. Uh, not as much as now, definitely. Uh, you know, male-dominated writers, I guess, and artists. You know, you could say other than. Uh, you know, blues singers and then the great band was a pioneer because it had Cynthia and Rose yeah. in the band traveling the world showing people how it should be done and it's taken a good three, four decades for people to build on that. Yeah, there's a lot of change. Uh, this, that was a time of extreme change, you know. Things, new things, like here's blossoming, new spirits blossoming. You know. yeah. well, Right in the Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.